Hi, this is part two of my series on reconditioning a Shodland lathe, and today's project is dealing with the tailstock, bore, and quill. Uh, it's usual to start with the tailstock rather than the headstock because uh, the headstock doesn't have any wear underneath it. It's just been sitting fixed to the bed, whereas the tailstock does have wear. So it's already lower, so we lower it down and get it to perfection, then we bring the headstock down into alignment with it. This is a really simple tailstock. It's a flat bottom, no inverted V-way, and it just registers on the top of the bed, and then there's a little lip that catches the front uh, flat surface of the bed. It's a single uh, piece. Uh, there's no two pieces allowing for adjustment or uh, for taper turning. So it's about as simple a tailstock as you can get but uh, it still needs lots of work to bring it back to original factory accuracy. Uh, the steps in this video dealing with the bore and the quill I think are pretty universal to any tailstock. The sequence here is to get the bore perfect, straight and with an excellent finish. Then we'll uh, fix the quill for a perfect fit in the bore. Fix the bore by lapping which can be incredibly accurate because the rolling abrasive with cylindrical lapping is self-correcting to the lap itself with a, a delicate feel and fine compound you can get bores to within a couple of micron. It's possible there could be a curve to the bore although I really don't think so because I've done this a number of times and using a, a mating shaft with a very very small amount of clearance like two tenths they just slide in perfectly. If there was a curve to the bore that wouldn't happen. Start by turning the body of the lap and then slitting it lengthwise. I'm going to soft solder copper onto the steel body and I find that by tinning the steel first basically with some flux and soft solder uh, getting it on the piece and then brushing the excess off with a paper towel I get a much uh, much better joint that the uh, the solder and flux just doesn't flow as well on steel if it's not tinned. Here's a nice piece of copper uh, cut to size and uh, annealed and bent into shape ready to ready for soldering. To anneal copper you just need to get it red hot. You do not have to quench it that just allows you to speed up the process. The copper is held in place with binding wire and I soft solder it on using a propane torch for heat. Once soldered I drill and tap for the halfway through for the adjusting screw. I use a fine thread so I have the most adjustment possible. And uh, if you look at the far right end of the lap sitting in the vise, you'll see that there's a small collar that's been added. This was added and then soldered in place. And it's so that uh, without it, if we had uh, put some torque on the adjustment screw, it would just splay the, uh, the, the whole lap open in a kind of a Y shape. Uh, a set screw goes in there and it's off to the lathe. The steel body is designed such that once the copper is added and a very light skim cut is taken off, it just fits the inside bore. The lathe gets covered in paper towels and a fine lapping compound is used. In the photo, note the locking screw is in place. This type of tailstock lock has a split in the casting and of course tension on that screw or not is going to change the geometry so I put just a tiny bit of tension on the screw and then we'll lap the bore round with that in place. When doing this type of lapping you need to either let the work or the lap float. You can't have both fixed in place as it relies on a feel to get things uh, accurate. As you can see here I'm holding on to the tailstock and it's sort of a process of adjusting the tensioning screw just a tiny bit, expanding the lap, and then uh, with a light hand feeling where the tight spots are. Eventually you get to the point where things are consistent over the length of the bore without any tight spots, and you know you're done. And we are done. That bore is looking fantastic, super smooth and super accurate. All that's left to do is to very carefully measure it. And then, uh, then we have to make the tailstock quill to fit which presents some challenges, but uh, let's get into it. Our goal is to have about two tenths clearance between the quill and the bore. And since we've just made the bore bigger by lapping, we've got to do something to enlarge the size of the quill. And that something is hard chroming. The process is to grind the existing uh, quill down to provide a clean surface for hard chroming get it hard chrome which builds up the diameter and then re-grind uh, the, the hard chrome down to the correct OD to fit the bore. But first we've got to figure out how to hold this piece. What I did was lightly press a piece of brass into one end of the quill. 
uh, I guess it would be the hand wheel end. And then with the quill held in a collet chuck, turn to center into the piece of brass. This should get my center very close to being uh, to the current OD of the quill. I then made a steel piece with a taper to match the collet seat in the other end of the quill and put a threaded rod through so that I could kind of uh, sandwich the quill between the pressed in brass piece and the collet mimicking tapered piece at the other end. The first step for the hard chroming process is to clean up what's there and grind off some of the existing material. The reason is, is to create a good surface to uh, hard chrome too, but also to ensure that the final thickness of the hard chrome is sufficient. If you have a very, very thin uh, half a thou or a thou of hard chrome, it will likely flake. So if I recall, the ideal thickness is five or eight thou. So uh, after you grind the hard chrome uh, buildup to fit the bore, you want to be left with sort of a thickness of say five thou. Double check with your hard chromer because it's a, been a while ago that I did that. I recall that's what it was. I have a tool and cutter grinder with a motorized workhead that I use as a light cylindrical grinder. If you don't have the grinding capability, um, you're going to have to either outsource this work. Most of the places that do hard chroming also do finish grinding or make a new quill from scratch. There's really no other way around it. You have to get about two tenths clearance between the bore and the quill. And um, you have to either build the existing quill up or you have to make a new one. Here's the quill ready to go out for hard chroming. Uh, what a great finish, but uh, it's all gonna be covered up by the hard chrome. With the quill back from the hard uh, chrome, or back from the platers with the hard chroming done, I reattached my uh, mandrel mechanism to hold it in place and now it's a matter of grinding it to the OD that we want. Uh, there's a couple of things if you're new to cylindrical grinding that makes it uh, really neat. First of all this machine I scraped from the ground up and have just got it dialed into perfection so it's very accurate and uh, readily possible to get to grind things to a, a tenth or better. A tenth is pretty darn small, and a couple of things that give us a fighting chance at that is number one, I've mounted a Minotoya tense indicator on the back of the uh, saddle so that I can carefully watch the infeed amounts. Uh, secondly, grinders like this have a top table that pivots. If you look at the photo, there's in the center of the table, there's a pivot, and on the far right hand side, there are these adjustment uh, screws. So what you do is you grind a section in the middle close to the pivot and then you go and you grind a section in the end and you measure the diameter and you tweak these screws until you get things dead on. I, use, I usually end up tweaking it a little bit as I'm grinding. It's nice to have a grinding allowance to be able to do so. But when you've got it dialed in, you can grind a piece this long to a tenth. Uh, finally, it's crucial to use flood coolant. You can get away with not using flood coolant on a surface grinder because the mag chuck becomes a nice big heat sink, although I prefer flood on a surface grinder, but it's absolutely needed on a cylindrical grinder. There's no heat sink for this shaft, and as it grinds away, the heat buildup will cause it to just keep growing and growing, and you'll never spark out. Eventually, success. The goal has been two tenths clearance, which is a fairly close fit with a bit of oil that will mean that the shaft will not, or the quill will not fall out of the bore, but is still free to move. Here's the uh, results that I got. I'm up to 10 minutes already, uh, so I'll cut it off here and invite you back for part three, which will be grinding the taper on the end of the tailstock. I do appreciate the comments and the likes. It's nice to hear from you guys, so uh, keep them coming, and I'll be back soon. Thanks.